New post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Johnny, I know how you feel. No, you don't, Mr. Carter. Nobody knows how I feel. But a couple of guys named Ford and Bisbee are going to find out. And soon... Now, wait a they minute. They framed me. They stole three years out of my life. They killed my mom. Now I'm going to do something about Johnny, it. Johnny, Johnny, Nick's your friend. Listen I to him. I don't want any friends that work with the cops. Because I got a job to do that the cops ain't going to like. <laughs> And now, The Case of the Double Frame, today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Today, Johnny Wade is being released from state penitentiary, and at 10 o'clock in the morning, Nick is waiting outside the prison gate. His secretary and assistant, Patsy Bowen, and Sergeant Matheson of the Homicide Squad are in the car with him. Yeah, what's Johnny going to think when he sees a cop with you, Nick? Well, I'll simply tell him the truth, Matty, that you and I are old friends and that you came along to get some fresh country air. <laughs> Johnny won't be suspicious of any friend of Nick's, Sergeant. Uh. Why, when Johnny was a member of the downtown boys club, he simply worshipped Nick. Used to call him his big brother. Yeah, you see, Johnny never had any family except his mother, and she's dead now, so... Well, naturally, I wanted to meet him when he got out. You sure must have a lot of faith in him, Nick. I have, Matty. Even after he stole 20,000 bucks? Now, look, Matty, I don't believe he did. If I'd only known about it sooner, I might have been able to prove that Johnny was innocent. But we were out west on a case at the time of his trial. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was only recently when we learned he was being released today that we knew he'd been in prison. I made a few inquiries, but the evidence was all against him. And his employers, Ford and Bisbee, flatly refused to give me any help. Nick, mm. look, isn't that Johnny coming through the gate now? Why, it looks like him. It but... is. Oh, Nick. Nick, how he's changed. He's so thin. Now, wait a minute. I'll be right back. Right. Yeah. Hey, Johnny. Johnny! Johnny Wade! Yeah? It's me, Johnny. Nick Carter. Oh, hello, Mr. Carter. What are you doing here? Why, oh, I thought you'd like to have me meet you when you got out. We're old friends, aren't we? We used to be. Well, we still are, Johnny. Come on. Patsy's in the car. She's anxious to meet you. And say, I've got a job lined up for no you. No, thanks. But listen, son. No soap, Mr. Carter. He was always swell to me, and I appreciate it, but I don't want any friends. Not anymore. Oh, don't be foolish, John. Okay, so I'm foolish. Maybe three years in stir makes you that way. But it needn't, Johnny. Now, look, I want you to forget all forget that. Forget it? Forget that Ford and Bisbee framed me? Forget that for the rest of my life people are going to say I'm a crook and a jailbird? I know it won't be easy. Maybe I ought to forget my mom, too. Maybe I ought to pretend that it wasn't grieving over me that killed her. Believe me, I understand how you feel, Johnny. No, but... you don't. Nobody knows how I feel. There's a couple of guys that's going to find out. A couple of guys named Ford and Bisbee. Now, wait a minute. When they framed me, they stole three years out of my life. They killed my mom. Now I'm going to do something about it. Johnny, I'm speaking as your friend. You used to say I was the best friend you ever had. And I'm not forgetting it. But I got a job to do, and friends will only get in my way. Especially friends that work with the cops. So long, Mr. Carter. Johnny, wait a minute. You can tell Mr. Ford and Mr. Bisbee I'll be seeing them. Johnny's in a dangerous mood, Mr. Bisbee, and I think both you and Mr. Ford should be prepared for trouble. If you're such a friend of his, Carter, why did you come here to warn us? Because he's had trouble enough. I don't want him making any more for himself. I see. And it's not out of any regard for our safety. I'm thinking of that too, Mr. Ford. I don't blame Johnny for being sore if he's innocent of stealing that money. Innocent? He's a dirty crook, Miss Bowen, and he didn't get half what he deserved. That's what I thought at the time, Bisbee. But I'm beginning to wonder. You're out of your mind, Ford. If he didn't get the money, who did? Did you get it? Did I? I beg your pardon, Mr. Ford, but I have the report. Uh, just a minute, Miner. Yes, sir. I put that money in the briefcase myself. Uh, you saw me, didn't you, Miner? Oh, yes, sir. 
As I testified in court, I brought the cash from the bank and handed it over to you, and I was there when you put it in the briefcase, fastened the case, and gave it to Johnny. And the young thief admitted that the briefcase never left his hands till he gave it to you at the airport, Ford. Well, the money certainly wasn't there then. All right, then. He took it. Nobody else could have. I don't care. Johnny wasn't the kind of a boy to steal. I see, Miss Bowen. You think either Mr. Ford or I stole our own money. That isn't what she said, Mr. Bisbee, but it still seems odd that neither of you gentlemen would give me any cooperation in trying to find out who did steal it. Right. Rubbish. We knew who got it. By the time you came around, he'd been tried and convicted. We were both pretty angry, Mr. Carter. This was a new business then, and 20000 was a serious loss. It was disastrous as far as I was concerned. You had money in the bank, Ford, but I was broke. Well, if you didn't put all your money on the horses or a roulette wheel... You don't have to give me another lecture, Ford. Then don't complain because you're always broke. Now, just a minute, gentlemen. You're getting away from the subject. Oh, you're quite right, Mr. Carter. And while both Mr. Bisbee and I appreciate your warning us about Johnny... I don't think there's any cause for alarm. But he blames you, too, for his mother's death, and there's no telling what he's likely to do. He'll most likely get that money from wherever he's got it hidden and leave this part of the country. It sounds logical to me. I don't think he'll want to attract any attention to himself by coming here. Gentlemen, I hope you're right. If he tries anything with me, I'll break his thieving neck. <laughs> What can I do for you, Letty? You Daddy Greer? What if I am, huh? My name's Johnny Wade. Link Garson told me to look you up when I got out. Link Garson, eh? Well, well, well. Link said that if I come to you, you'd take care of me. So? Well, I guess any friend of Link's is all right. So, uh, what do you want from Daddy Greer? Just one thing. A gun. Johnny, boy, it's good to see you. Hello, Mr. Miner. Still doing the bookkeeping around here? Yes. Oh, Johnny, you got thin. It must have been pretty bad up there, wasn't it? Skip it. Well, uh, Johnny, if there's anything I can do... No, thanks. Are Ford and Bisbee in their offices? Yes. Oh, but you don't want to go in there. Oh, don't you... I? Johnny! Johnny, listen to me! What's the idea of... Oh, you. Yeah, it's me the guy you and that crooked partner of yours railroaded into the pen. Now, hold on, Johnny. Keep your hands on the desk, Mr. Ford. Put away that gun, you crazy fool. Maybe you didn't know my mom was dead, Mr. Ford. Or maybe you wouldn't care. She died thinking I was a crook and a thief. Oh, don't do anything you'll be sorry for, Johnny. I couldn't do anything to you I'd be sorry for. Or to Bisbee either. Now, wait. No, wait. I waited long enough. And now... Oh, watch out, Bisbee. He's got a gun. Drop it. Drop it or I'll break your arm. I... I've got it, Bisbee. That door hadn't knocked me off balance when you opened the it. The door isn't the only thing that's going to knock you off balance, you crook. Get up. Get up, you dirty. That's enough, Bisbee. Can't you see he's out cold? Is anything wrong in here? Oh. I ought to call the police and have him locked up. Oh, no. No, please, Mr. Bisbee. I I'm sure he didn't know what he was doing. No, so you're a friend of his, too, are you, Miner? Well, not exactly. Well, sir. get him into the outer office, and when he comes to, tell him if he shows up here again, I'll send him back to jail where he belongs. Nick Carter speaking. What's the matter, Ford? Did Johnny show up? Yes, yes, he did. He came to the office early this afternoon, threatened me with a revolver. Fortunately, he really got it away from him. Well, I'm glad to hear nobody was hurt. What did you do? Have him arrested? No, no. Bisbee was going to, but he changed his mind. And I'm glad he did. So am I. Sending him back to jail might be the worst thing in the world for him right now. You saw how bad he looks. I know. He was talking pretty wildly, too. Evidently, he's been brooding over his mother's death. That's what I mean, Mr. Ford. If I can get hold of Johnny, I'm sure I can straighten him out. Maybe it's because I take a personal interest in him, but I still don't believe he stole your money. That's why I called you, Carter. I'm not so sure he did either. What? You've changed your mind? Well, if he had the money hidden away, why would he come up here threatening me and take a chance in going back to jail? It doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. A guilty man would go get the money and leave town as quietly as possible. Hmm, that's what I think. But if he didn't take the money, I'd like to know who did. Are you asking me to make an investigation? Mm, yes. 
If you don't think it's too late to find out anything after three years. As a matter of fact, I've been doing some looking around on my own hook, Mr. Ford. And I turned up one very interesting fact. Hmm? What's that? May not mean anything, but in August of 1945, your partner, J.T. Bisbee, bought $28,000 worth of stock in an East Texas oil company. Uh, he couldn't have. In 1945, Bisbee didn't have a dime. So he said, but he paid $28,000 for oil stock just the same. August 1945? Well, that was less than two months after that 20000 disappeared. I, I wonder... Of course, there's an $8,000 difference between the amount that was stolen and the amount Bisbee invested in oil stock, but it still... Bisbee was in charge of the office that year, Carter. I was on the road all the time. Well? Everybody will be leaving the office in a few minutes. But I think I'll stay down here and look over the books for 1945. Maybe I can discover where that extra 8,000 came from. Do you know enough about bookkeeping to recognize something wrong if you found it? I think so. And if anything does look suspicious, I'll have Miner come down and check with me on it. Good idea. And let me know how you come out. I'll do that. I'll give you a ring first thing in the morning. <laughs> It's fine in cold weather, Charlie, but on a night like this, I'd rather be back pounding a beat of... Uh, two to one, it's some dame whose kid hasn't got back from the movies yet. 45th Precinct, Sergeant Lafferty speaking. This is... <coughs> Adam Ford, Jansen Belling. Oh, yes, Mr. Ford, what's the matter? I... <coughs> I've been shot. I... I think I'm dying. Hold it, uh... Charlie, get an ambulance over to the Jansen building on the double. Guy's been shot. Right, Sarge. You still there, Mr. Ford? Yes, I... Uh, just hold on. We got an ambulance on the way. Do you know who shot you? It was... <coughs> it was John Wade. You're sure of that, Mr. Ford? Yes, I saw him. Johnny Wade. Johnny... Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford. Snap it up, Charlie. I think he's croaked already, but I got the name of the guy that did it. <coughs> As the police ambulance speeds toward the Jensen building, the alarm goes out to pick up Johnny Wade for murder. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now back to The Case of the Double Frame. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. It is an hour later. The photographers and fingerprint men have left, but Nick, Patsy, and Sergeant Matheson have remained at the office of Ford and Bisbee. The body of Adam Ford still lies beside the desk, his dead hand clutching the telephone with which his last call was made to police headquarters. Uh, wish we could get hold of Bisbee, but his housekeeper says he's been out all evening. Have you found any trace of Johnny yet? No, Patsy, but every cop in town is on the lookout for him. I see. We found out he's registered at a little hotel called the Meckley. Uh-huh. I got a couple of the boys stationed there, too. Oh, not that he'll be crazy enough to come back. Matty, I have a hunch Johnny didn't do this. Oh, Nick, use your head. Now, I know you like the boy, and I'm sorry, but we've got Ford's dying statement that Johnny Wade shot him. Yes, I know, but I think the killer himself made that call to police headquarters after Ford was dead. Oh, for Pete's sake, And then Nick. put the phone in Ford's hand to make the story look good. Well, if that's the best idea you can dream up. I'm not dreaming. Look at that phone. It's in Ford's hand backwards. What? Why, yes. The mouthpiece and the earphone are reversed. Ford's thumb is next to the mouthpiece. Well, I can see that. But what? No one would hold a phone that way, Matty. You'd have to twist your arm half out of its socket to speak into it. Hey, you're right, Nick. Now, how in... What, uh... That isn't the phone in Ford's hand, Sergeant. It's huh? the other one on the desk. He had two of them. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> uh, Sergeant Matheson speaking. Oh, you have, huh? Good. We'll be down to talk to him pretty soon. Did they find Johnny? No, Bisbee. He's down at headquarters. Oh. Uh, look, uh, how about Johnny Wade? You... What? Well, why didn't you tell me before that? Fourteen minutes after ten, huh? All right, Hanson, I'll see you in a few minutes. Uh, that's funny. What is, Matty? Nick Hanson says Ford called Johnny's hotel tonight, left a message that Johnny should come here to the office right away, no matter what time he got in. What was that about 14 minutes after 10? That was the time on the message to the hotel, Patsy. They always mark it down when a guest isn't in. Hey, Matty. Yeah? thought you said Ford died at 8 minutes after 10. Well, that's the time he phoned headquarters. All right. Hey, wait a minute. Yes, Ford was dead before the call was made to headquarters. 
And that call was made six minutes before the call to Johnny. Then both of those calls were fakes. But but why should anybody call Johnny? I can think of one very good reason, Patsy. The murderer is trying to make sure that Johnny isn't able to defend himself on the charge of killing Ford. Nick, it was a trap. That's exactly what I think. And if Johnny had got that message and started for here, he probably wouldn't be alive now. Oh, Nick, you don't suppose the killer could have found him on the street? No, it's not likely, Patsy. The police will pick him up when he returns to the hotel, if they don't locate him sooner. You know, I'm beginning to think you're right about the lad being framed, Nick. But who's doing it? We may find the answer in this open ledger on Ford's desk. Now, how can you tell anything from that with ink spilled all over it? Yeah, everything on the page has been blotted out. That's just the point. Looks to me as though the ink had been spilled purposely and then spread around. Oh, Nick, that's hmm. the ledger for August 1945. That's an old one. Yes. Ford told me this afternoon he was going to look over the books for 1945 to see whether there was any evidence that something crooked was going on then. Well, well if somebody tried to destroy what was on those pages, he didn't get away with it. The lab boys can bring out what's under that ink blot as clear as it ever was. No, I don't want to wait for that, Matty. Suppose we talk to the bookkeeper tonight. Uh, Miner? Yeah. If anybody would know what was in this ledger, he would. Uh-huh. Well, I sent a man over to his boarding house after him. You know, he was a witness to that brawl this afternoon. Good. He ought to be here any minute. I... Oh. <clears throat> Sergeant Matheson speaking. Huh? He did. Well, he never got here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you'd better stay there and wait for him. Right. What was that, Matty? Miner isn't at his boarding house, Nick. He left for here quite a while ago. What? Yeah. It seems someone who said he was Adam Ford called and asked him to come to the office right away. What? Why, that's exactly the message that was left at the hotel for Johnny. Yeah. Only Miner got his message and started out. And he isn't here yet. But, but why should anyone... Well, maybe he did know something about that ledger, Nick. Maybe he knew too much. Perhaps you're right, Matty. Let's go down to headquarters and see whether Mr. Bisbee thinks so, too. I don't know anything about any phone calls. I didn't even know Adam was dead until the police officer told me. Where have you been all evening, Mr. Bisbee? That's my business. Yeah? It's police business now, mister. Well, I... If you must know, I was at the Blue Eagle. The gambling house? Yes. Can you prove that? Why, someone will remember me, but uh -huh. I... Uh-huh. Well, you better just hope that somebody does. Mr. Bisbee, your partner was examining the ledger for August 1945 at the time he was murdered. Well? That was the month you invested $28,000 in oil stocks, wasn't it? All right, it was. So what? Thought you were broke in 1945. Well, I... I... Where'd you get that $28,000? I... I won it in the poker game. Oh, you play for high stakes, don't you, Mr. Bisbee? Suppose I do? What of it? Can you prove that's where you got the money? After three years, don't be ridiculous. Hmm. Matty. Yeah? While you check Mr. Bisbee's alibi for tonight, I think Patsy and I'd better go over to Johnny Wade's hotel. Yeah? What for, Nick? I'm worried about it, Matty. And maybe the desk clerk or somebody there may be able to tell us where he went tonight. I'm sorry, Mr. Carter, but Mr. Wade checked out and he left no forwarding address. Checked out? When? Not more than five minutes ago. You mean he was here in the hotel and the police the didn't... police... Oh, you mean those cops across the lobby are waiting for Mr. Wade? Didn't what? you know? I know, sir. I just came on duty. All right, all right. But how did he get out of here without their seeing him? Oh, Mr. Wade wasn't here. He phoned and said we could release the room. He'd paid in advance. Phone? Oh, Nick, another phone call. If the police are looking for him, they may be able to catch him at the office of Ford and Bisbee in the Jansen building. Why do you say that? Well, there was a message from a Mr. Ford that he should go there immediately, no matter how late it was. And you gave him that message? Of course I did, and, and he said he'd stop there on his way out of town. Oh, oh! thank goodness he's all right, Nick. When he gets to the office, the police will be waiting. Yes, but I think we'd better see whether we can catch him before he gets there. Why? Because it may be that whoever phoned him doesn't want him to reach the office. <laughs> Huh? Oh, Mr. Miner, what are you doing Mr. here? Mr. Ford went home, Johnny, but he asked me to wait here and drive you to his house. Come on, get in. What's he want to see me about? Well, I think he's found out that you didn't take that money after all. He has? That's the impression I got. Now hurry up, get in. Well, you bet I will. 
Hey, is this on the level? You're not kidding me? Take my word for it, Johnny. Before long, your troubles will be all over. What are we doing out here, Mr. Miner? You said we were going to Mr. Ford's house. He's at his country place, Johnny. We're sure out at the end of nowhere. Don't look like there's three cars a year come over this road. It is lonely, isn't it? Well, here we are, Johnny. What do you mean, here we are? Where's the house? There isn't any house, Johnny. Only an old stone quarry, about half full of water. But it's very, very deep, Johnny. I don't get it. You will. Get out. Hey, what's the idea of the gun? Get out, Johnny. You're going to join Mr. Ford. Right here. As Johnny Wade gets out of the car, there is no sign of mercy on the face of his supposed friend, the bookkeeper. Only a grim determination to kill. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of The Case of the Double Frame. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Beside a lonely country road, the headlights of a parked car shine upon the figure of an elderly man with a revolver in his hand and a young man standing helplessly at the edge of an abandoned rock quarry half filled with water. You're the one that took that 20 grand three years ago. You're the one that framed me. It was so easy, Johnny. After Bisbee put the money in the briefcase, he turned his back to get some papers off the desk and I took the money out again. That's all. You put that ticket from Montreal in my pocket, too. Of course I did. It made the police think you were planning to run away. It is a very efficient plan, Johnny. Yeah, you're a smart guy, you are. So you bring me out here. Make me carry all this scrap iron over from your car. They make excellent weights, Johnny. Excellent. Now I want you to take that roll of wire and fasten the scrap iron securely around your ankle. Huh? Go on. Take a piece of that scrap iron. Okay, I'll take it. And give it right back to you. Why, you young... Oh! Keep away, Johnny. I don't want to kill you. Just yet. Okay, okay. What do you want to bump me off for? You framed me. You got away with it. You have to disappear, Johnny. You see, you murdered Mr. Ford tonight. I did what? I needed that money three years ago to cover a shortage in my accounts. And tonight the old fool started looking over the books. He found you'd faked him, huh? Unfortunately for him, yes. He phoned me to come down to the office to accuse me. But I wasn't going to the penitentiary as you did. So you knocked him off? Oh, no, Johnny. The police have Mr. Ford's dying statement that you killed him. I know. Because I made that dying statement myself over the phone. Well, you double-crossing... That's enough, Johnny. Get busy with that scrap iron. With his bullet in my arm? You're crazy. You're right. I'll have to attend to that detail myself. Later. Goodbye, Johnny. Now, look, Mr. Miner. It won't hurt much, Johnny. I'm just going to... What the... That's just a warning, Miner. Drop that gun or I'll shoot to kill. Mr. Carter... Where the devil did you come from? Patsy, take Miner's gun. Right, Nick. Look, Carter, I I can explain. Johnny confessed to killing Mr. Ford. He was going to kill me... Save your breath, Miner. For you, the highway back to town is going to be a one-way road to the electric chair. How's your arm, Johnny? Oh, it'll be all right. It's just a flesh wound. Oh, gee, you're lucky, Johnny. We were on our way to Ford's office when Nick saw you getting into Miner's car. And you followed us all the way out from town? Yeah. If we had to drive without lights and stay quite a distance behind, our Miner would have noticed us. I still don't know why he wanted to bump me off. After the way he framed me, I never could have proved I... I didn't kill Mr. Ford. Well, he couldn't take any chances on you having an alibi. Nick? Nick, how did Bisbee get that 28000 Did he really win it in a poker game? There's no reason to doubt it now, Patsy. Oh, Johnny, here's something Bisbee asked me to give you. Oh? Uh Uh-huh. Probably a nice little apology for sending you to the penitentiary for something you didn't do. I just don't like that man. Well, what is it, Mr. Carter? Here. Gee, it's a check. For a thousand dollars. Oh. Mm-hmm. 
He thought it might make up for at least part of what you've been through. Oh, Johnny, that's wonderful. Now you can make a real start in life. Yeah. Yeah, gee, a thousand bucks. I wish Mom could be here to see this. And he has a job for you, too. A much better job than you had before. Gosh, Mr. Carter. That just goes to show you how wrong a fellow can be sometimes. Mr. Bisbee ain't a bad guy at all when you get to know what he's really like. You know, Johnny, that's generally true. Very few people are really bad when you get to know them. I'm glad you found that out while you're still young. It'll make your life a whole lot easier sometimes. Well, Nick, can you tell us something about the adventure new post-war old Dutch cleanser is going to bring us next week? Yes, Mike. Next week, we're going to meet a young man who didn't commit murder because the victim wasn't running backwards. And the only way Nick could prove it was by tracing $5 worth of toy money to the real killer. Well, between running backwards and toy money, there ought to be plenty of excitement. What do you call this adventure? I call it The Case of the Bull and Bear. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count... Use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.